We've just heard a wonderful lecture on uh, courtly love and romance and the literature of northern France. And in fact, I brought in one more picture just to show courtly love. Uh, you know, and I think I can tie this lecture on the, the romance literature of, the, uh, of northern France to our topic that we're going to look at uh, for the rest of tonight's lecture. Uh, on medieval church and state. Uh, for one thing, um, at least one monk, and, and, and actually there were a lot more, but one monk in particular wrote about uh, love and human love between a man and a woman. And some of the things he said were quite interesting. He didn't disapprove of the love between men and women. What he actually said was that love develops in stages, that this is Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, that first you have to learn to love yourself, and then you learn to love your wife or husband, your mate, you learn to love your neighbor, you learn to love your friends, which is a higher love. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself, of course, is in the Bible. Uh, you, you love your friends, and friendship is the highest relationship between human beings. And finally, love of God. Uh, God, of course, is love, as the Bible says. So love is a good thing. I also uh, can tie this into our whole um, concept of the 12th century Renaissance and the concept of, uh, um, now I'm forgetting the word, <laughs> um, not humanitarian, but uh, Well, human emotions, the, the value of human beings, the idea that uh, man is created in God's image and God became man by becoming Christ and taking the form of human beings. And uh, therefore, man is good and everything human is good. And this includes human emotions. So that one of the things that we see in, for example, the psychological literature of Chrétien de Troyes is, um, is the exploration of human emotions. And, and this is a good thing. Human emotions are a good thing. Um, also, if we look at the art of courtly love, there's a certain mathematical uh, aspect of the art of courtly love, as Andreas Kapalanis uh, describes it, because what he does is go through in a very mathematical way, examining love from every single angle that he can think of. And he goes through, and he first he starts by saying, what is love? Uh, how is love experienced between two people? What kinds of people can love each other? What is love like between uh, to um, to people of the court. What is love like between a man of the upper class and a woman of the lower class? What is uh, love like between a woman of the upper class and a man of the lower class? He what he does is like like Saint Thomas Aquinas when he asks, "What is God and how do you define God?" and goes through with every aspect of God in a very mathematical way. So does. Uh, Andreas Kapolanos treat love in that way, and so we can see these these common features of uh, medieval culture. Well, now we're going to turn to another subject uh, that has to do with the growth of um, administration and government in various ways, and we're going to look at medieval church and state. So could we look at our slate for a minute? This is me this time giving the lecture. Um, uh, my department is the history department, and I'm going to talk for the rest of tonight on medieval church and state. And uh, you may already know that one of the characteristics of European culture is that there's a dialogue between church and state, uh, and what we end up with is the separation of church and state. So how did that happen? How did people start? looking at the church and state. In fact, in every other culture in the world, uh, just about, um, church and state are joined together. Whatever the religion is, the state controls it, and in every other culture in the world. So this is kind of interesting that medieval Europe develops something differently. Again, Europe is pushing the envelope, and medieval people are taking things to extremes. In this case, it's church and state. So let's look a little bit at church and state. 
Uh, the history of the medieval and church and state begins with Constantine, and Constantine is, of course, a Roman emperor who rules uh, from about 312 to about 330. Uh, in, uh, Constantine pulls the Roman state together after a period of anarchy and civil wars. And Constantine does something unique in the Roman Empire, and that is to recognize Christianity. What he does is to make it legal, whereas earlier emperors had persecuted the Christians. And so the Christians adored Constantine, and he becomes the model Christian emperor, the modern Christian head of state. And he's a model that's returned to time and time again. The way in which he ruled, the Roman Empire is called Caesaropapism, and Caesaropapism is a system in which both church and state are ruled by the emperor. Constantine favored the church in very many ways. He made laws for the church. Uh, he took charge of the church councils, and the first church councils were really um, held in the time of Constantine. Uh, the Council of Nicaea is the most famous one, but there were others. And at the councils, he combated the heresies that were popping up all over. Uh, he treated the churches in favorable ways in uh, the Roman Empire. He made the churches tax-exempt corporations, and being a corporation, meant that the church was, what is a corporation? A corporation is an eternal person who never dies. Uh, a legal person and a corporation never dies. And so that the churches could then inherit property and this allowed them to become wealthy. Con uh, Constantine also sponsored the first Christian uh, church buildings and so we find for the first time actual churches and buildings. Uh, one of the, uh, Eusebius of Caesarea wrote um, a history of the Christian church and uh, at that time and just enshrined Constantine as the greatest ruler who had ever uh, ever been uh, on earth. And in fact, one thing he said was, Constantine is to Christ as Christ is to God. Now, can you see the import of that statement? What is he saying there? Constantine is to Christ as Christ is to God. What what is the the ratio? Yeah. Is he saying he's as if he is God's child? Yes, as if uh, if Christ is God's son, Constantine is Christ's son. And so this today would be regarded as heresy. I mean, and later on it is. And, and so that's how far, that's the extreme that the Christians went to. Uh, here is a statue of Constantine in the Lateran, and I'm sorry this is a little bit dim. Um, maybe you could focus in on a little more. We can see it a little better. Can you see it pretty well? Let's see what Constantine looks like. Okay, he's in the standard pose of a Roman emperor, uh, but he's a Christian emperor, and that makes him different. And, and this is the kind of relationship that... Um, that we're really talking about here. This is actually uh, an 11th century manuscript, or it might be 10th century, uh, the Emperor Henry II, but the concept is God crowns the emperor. He gets his power from God, and this is exactly uh, the relationship that was seen with Constantine, and it's picked up over and over and over again, and you can see why kings like this. Uh, like this concept. So Constantine is a role model that kings like to emulate. Okay, St. Ambrose, however, challenged this concept and he punished the emperor Theodosius for a massacre that Theodosius had carried out in one of the cities of the Roman emperor. And St. Ambrose asked, what has the emperor to do with the church? And this is the first time then that church and state, the union of church and state, is questioned by anybody. St. Augustine of Hippo, another of the church fathers, however, saw the emperor's rule of the state or a king's rule of the state as something that is good. St. Augustine of Hippo, of course, wrote the city of God. He's temporary to Saint Ambro uh, contemporary to St. Ambrose. Uh, St. Augustine of Hippo died um, shortly after 410. 
uh, 410 is when he wrote The City of God. And what he says about church and state in there is that by human law, a man says, this estate is mine, this house is mine, by human law and therefore by the law of emperors. Why? Because God distributed these human laws to the human race through the emperors and kings of the world. So he saw an emperor or a king as a good person. A ruler brings order to human life and rulers are necessary and a good Christian obeys the law of the emperor. Uh, so this was, uh, and of course, St. Augustine of Hippo is one of the most important writers and philosophers of the time. The City of God sets the standard for the whole rest of the Middle Ages. And here is a picture of St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, as he wrote The City of God. And this is an interesting picture of a miniature of the actual City of God so that you can see all the hierarchies in the city of God and the emperor. I haven't looked to see where the emperor is. He shows all the different factions of society in the city of God. I wonder if this is the emperor up here. There are certainly angels around there. So we can see his concept of the whole of society. Oh, we're going to focus on that a little bit more. It certainly looks like the emperors and kings ruling from, from the top of the city of God. Okay, now let's turn to some other thinkers of, uh, uh, of a slightly later period. Pope Galatius I, in a letter to the emperor uh, uh, Anastasius, who was an emperor of the Byzantine Empire in 494, uh, wrote a tract concerning the powers of the emperor and the powers of the priest. And what this is a key text that governs the consideration of church and state. Two swords there are, august emperor, by which this world is chiefly ruled. The sacred authority, auctoritas, of the priesthood and the royal power, potestas. Although you take, prece although you take precedence over all mankind in dignity, Nevertheless, you should piously bow the neck to those who have charge of divine affairs and seek from them the means of your salvation. And this is usually known as the two swords theory. So we have the two swords that rule side by side, uh, in effect, uh, the emperor who has the sacred authority, uh, who has the royal power, potestas, and the priest which who has the sacred authority or the auctoritas. And this sets up the conditions of the debate between church and state for later. Okay, and this picture shows the spiritual and temporal power. And of course, the power is given by God. And we can see God here giving the power. This is a 10th century mosaic or Christ, this is actually Christ giving to St. Peter the keys of heaven, uh, the keys to the kingdom of heaven by which he will bind and loose everybody, and to, Saint, to Constantine the batter, banner symbolic of earthly dominion. So in this 10th century mosaic, the powers of church and state are equal but they're separate, and they're being, uh, they're, they're being handed the symbol of their power by Christ, of their authority and power to rule. Uh, now we're going to turn to another thinker who alters the terms of this debate somewhat. This is Pope Gregory I, and Pope Gregory I uh, uh, is usually called Gregory the Great. He ruled around the year 600. I believe he died in something like 604. But, but around the year 600, he was pope. And one of the most important things he did was to send missionaries to England and uh, missionaries who converted England to Roman Christianity, as we've already seen. And what did, and Gregory is considered the founder of the medieval papacy. So Gregory, what Gregory had to say is very important. Let's look to see what he had to say. In the early 600s, 
Pope Gregory the Great wrote a letter to King Ethelbert of England. And what he said in this letter is, and I'll read this to you, Almighty God raises up certain good men to be rulers over nations in order that he may by their means bestow the gifts of his righteousness upon all those over whom they are set. Watch carefully over the grace you have received from God and hasten to extend the Christian faith among the people who are subject to you. Strengthen the morals of your subjects by outstanding purity of life, by exhorting them terrifying, enticing, and correcting them, and by showing them an example of good works. It was thus that Constantine, the most religious emperor, converted the Roman state from the false worship of idols and subjected it and himself to Almighty God. So here Pope Gregory the Great is holding out clearly Constantine as a model to rule the church to the pagan kings of England. Uh, now, now, what do you think? How do you think that the kings of England would respond to this? Uh, when I not very favorably, I would think at that time. Oh, you don't think they would respond favorably? Anybody disagree? Actually, uh, yeah. Did you? Well, they would want to be the model for their society and culture. So, um, being you know, ordained by God to be the model and the example is exactly what I would think they would want, want to be seen as. They absolutely loved it. I mean, I mean, what he's saying is, you are ordained by God. God has chosen you to rule. And this is echoing Augustine too, isn't it? Echoing St. Augustine, that in the order of human society, God has chosen kings to rule and bring benefits to your state. But he goes beyond uh, St. Augustine. He says it is the responsibility of the king to look out for the welfare of his subjects and the way he can take care of them best is to see that they're converted to the Christian religion, to lead them to Christianity, and to do so, to, to take care of their morals and correct them by exhorting them, terrifying them, and enticing them. And terrifying is part of it too. But setting a good example, by your example, you should show them how to behave. So this is a model of what a good king should be. And of course, the kings love this. I mean, this, this makes them very powerful. And it, was, it, was, it, it makes them far more powerful than pagan Germanic theories of kingship would make them. Because the Germanic theories of kingship show them as kind of, you know, first among equals where they're elected by the German tribes, the Germanic tribes. They're elected, but they can also be deposed. And, and this gives them a, a power that never goes away, that God has chosen them. So, uh, so it's a more complete and overwhelming power than pagan religion gives to them, or pagan practices. Okay, now, from this, this Christian, um, uh, environment in England, of course, the, it was a great success. It was a huge success. The Roman Catholic missionaries uh, converted England, and England turned its face toward the continent. And we have a huge revival in England, a, a, a renaissance called the Northumbrian Renaissance in England. And from this school in England came St. Boniface, missionary to the continent from England, to Pope Zacharias uh, in 749, well, he, he wrote to Pope Zacharias in 749 saying, who should be called king? Who, who has, he who has the power of king or he who has the name of king? And of course, what he's referring to is the situation in Merovingian France, where the uh, kings of the Franks, the Merovingian kings of the Franks have become very weak and dissolute and uh, incompetent, and the mayors of the palace have gained all the power. And of course, the king he's talking about is Pepin, Pepin the Short, who is then crowned king of the Franks uh, by Boniface, St. Boniface, who then packs off the last Merovingian king to a monastery. 
Uh, and one of the upshots of this is that Pepin goes in and he rescues the popes from the Lombards who have taken over northern Italy and are threatening the popes. And uh, Pepin conquers the Lombards and gives the land of northern Italy to the popes. This is called the Donation of Pepin in 756. Uh, and it is Charlemagne, his son, who inherits this kingship. So kingship under Charlemagne also is modeled after kingship under Constantine. Now, on Christmas Day 800, Charlemagne is crowned king. And the Pope, uh, what Charlemagne does is to go into church that day and Christmas Day. And according to his uh, biographer Einhardt, Charlemagne was all unaware, and the Pope all of a sudden proclaimed him emperor loudly and popped a crown on his head. And Charles, of course, said, if I, had, if I had known he was going to do that, I never would have gone to church that day. The Pope hailed him to Charles, most pious Augustus, crowned by God, great and peace-giving emperor, life and victory. And this formula was repeated three times before the tomb of St. Peter. Charles was called Emperor and Augustus. Well, do you believe Charlemagne when he said he didn't want to be emperor? I do. I do. You don't believe it? No. Why? Why would he say that he would never have gone to church that day if he'd known that the uh, Pope was going to crown him emperor? Yeah, press your mic. Uh, because it would be a sign of his piousness, and it, it would be sort of an example of his, I guess, you know, uh, godliness, uh, to, to put it that way. Uh, uh, well, yeah, like, okay, to be, move, to be basically, reluctant. Basically, it's a political yeah. and, and uh, uh, you know, propaganda, almost. To say that, yes, and that is a topos, uh, a Christian topos, that it's routine to say, oh, no, I don't want the power. Yeah, you could interpret it that way. I still think he had more in mind than that. What does it mean if the Pope crowned him emperor? Yeah, it means God didn't. It means God didn't. And what it means, if the Pope has the power to crown him emperor, the Pope has the power to choose the emperor. What else, what else does the Pope have the power to do? It gives the church enormous power. Enormous power. Not only can the Pope choose the emperor, turn that around. If the Pope wants to, the Pope can depose the emperor. So I believe Charlemagne. I think he really would not have allowed the Pope to crown him. And one piece of evidence for that is when Charlemagne chose his own sons to be kings of the different regions of, um, of Europe, he crowned them himself. And so uh, he didn't bring the priests into it. Einhardt, in fact, said that Charlemagne came to Rome to restore the condition of the whole Roman church. And this is exactly what Charlemagne did in his kingdom. He passed laws that were equally for, uh, to regulate the secular world and the religious world. For example, he passed laws that all men had to swear an oath of allegiance to him and an oath of loyalty. And he also passed laws that all priests have to hold services on every Sunday in their church, and they have to know how to read and write, and they have to wear clerical garb, and, uh, and so on. And so he equally passed laws for the church and for the state, and he standardized uh, the liturgy all over his kingdom and standardized uh, the teaching in the church. In fact, there's an outstanding letter of uh, Charlemagne that uh, it was to the Pope that said, I will take care of the church and I will take care of converting the heathen and defending the church and your duty is to sit in Rome and pray. And so that was Charlemagne's concept of the relationship of church and state. He clearly had a model of Constantine in his mind and the Pope was peripheral to his vision of how the church and state should be presented. Now here is Charlemagne. Here's the coronation of Charlemagne uh, from a much later chronicle, of course, but we can see Charlemagne uh, being crowned by the Pope, and uh, he's raising his hand as if maybe he wants to ward this off, and all the bishops are around him. 
Okay, after Charlemagne, and you all remember your, your history, after Charlemagne uh, died, everything fell apart, and there were civil wars between the grandsons of Charlemagne. I'm really, I'm really zipping over this, but there was a devolution of power to the local level, and in France, the institutions of feudalism grew, uh, in which, which is very local. Uh, usually in, in regions, a local strong man would, would emerge as the, the governing power of the area and uh, relationships were very personal between a, um, between a vassal and his lord. The churches became proprietary and they, they turned into what are called Eigenkirche in, in Germany. In German, they are family churches, and so churches actually looked to the local aristocrats and strong warriors to protect them. And families donated lands uh, to the churches and felt that they should then have control over the churches. And so we see more and more local families spreading their control over the churches, putting their sons in as abbots, and the churches being governed for the good and welfare of the particular family that was their patron. Uh, in fact, it was common for uh, a male member, the leading male member of the family to become the advocatus or the spokesman for the abbey. An advocatus is someone who speaks for that abbey and, and the term evolves into lawyer. Avocat is the French word for lawyer, isn't it? That's where the lawyer begins. And we see these family members um, uh, presiding over these abbeys and defending them at court and defending their rights. Uh, both abbeys or monasteries, those are two words for the same thing, abbeys and monasteries and bishoprics uh, were bought and sold uh, and, and this is called simony or Nicolaitanism. Uh, when, uh, for example, a bishop buys his office, this is called simony, uh, when, he, when he simply buys the official office. And, and when it's sold, I think it's called Nicolaitanism, uh, when the, the, the count, the local count or duke sells it. Another thing that's going on is marriage of clerics. A lot of clerics are, are marrying, usually the monks don't marry, but the priests and the bishops are tending to marry in the different areas of Europe. And one thing that is harmful to the church is often their sons will inherit their bishopric. And so that it, it almost becomes a possession of that family. And this is a danger that really upsets uh, the church. Uh, also, we see a tendency for the church to be governed in different regions, regional churches. Um, so that uh, the Pope has absolutely no power in this system, but, but a local archbishop or primate in a local region will be the one who is, is governing what's going on. Nobody looks to the Pope as a figure of authority, but rather they look to regional characters because, remember, the government has devolved down to regions. And this is the kind of proprietary church, if you want to look at this, picture of, uh, this is uh, Count Vivian, the titular abbot of St. Martin of Tours, and he is actually the lay abbot, abbot who, who has jurisdiction and patronage over this abbey. And here is an example of the type of bishop that we were talking about. This is St. Rem Remy of Rems, and uh, here he is, uh, he becomes a saint, he's performing miracles. Um, he is healing the, the sick, and in the end, he baptizes uh, Clovis. But he's a regional bishop who has great power, and we see this as emerging at this time. Around the year 1000, we see movements toward reform of this system, and one of the, the early leaders is Pope Sylvester II, whose name before he was pope was Gerbert of Orillac. Uh, and he was a great student and mathematician as well as being pope. He kind of presages church reform. Uh, he forms an alliance with the Ottonian rulers. And in fact, when Otto III 
is left as a child. His father, Otto II, dies, and uh, um, Pope Sylvester actually becomes a kind of regent for Otto III and a defender of Otto III. And it's in his reign that he begins to promote the power of the papacy to govern uh, the empire. And so we see that movement toward reform. Another important movement toward reform is the founding of Cluny in 910. And Cluny is destined to become one of the great ruling monasteries of Europe. It's actually founded by Count William the Ninth of Aquitaine. Does anybody recognize who he is? Who is Count William the Ninth of Aquitaine? He's William of Aquitaine, the first troubadour and grandfather of Eleanor of Aquitaine. Yes, he was the first troubadour, and he ends up being a very pious man because when he founded Cluny, he did so with very generous provisions that Cluny was not to be a family monastery, not under control of the Counts of Aquitaine at all, but subject only to the Pope in Rome. And this freedom, this liberty that Cluny had was so unusual that the Cluniacs were able to go out and reform other monasteries. Also along with this freedom, they, they also um, practiced austerities. Uh, they uh, uh, celebrated, they're very famous for celebrating the liturgy and the mass and music was very big. A purity of religion, a return to austerity was very inspiring, but their liberties from any lay control uh, made them unique. They reformed other houses and they founded daughter houses so that they, uh, by the time of the uh, 12th century, they had founded what is called an order, and the Abbey of Cluny was the mother house over literally hundreds and even thousands of daughter houses. They formed a corporation with, uh, with, with fingers that went far flung internationally to every country of Europe. And so uh, the, the House of Cluny became very, very important. Uh, this is a reforming movement, reforming the monasteries. Meanwhile, the papacy was sinking to very low levels. Uh, and the Emperor Henry III actually took on the responsibility of reforming the papacy. What happened was uh, Benedict VIII became one of the most corrupt popes in history. Uh, Benedict IX, excuse me, became one of the corrupt, most corrupt popes in history. For one thing, he sold the papacy to somebody else because he wanted to get married. And after he got married, then he decided he wanted the papacy back. So he took it back. And finally, he was deposed by the Emperor Henry III. Then there were three contestants for Pope, three men vying for Pope with the mobs of Rome supporting each, uh, each one uh, or the various contenders. So what Henry III did was to simply depose them all and put a Cluniac monk in as pope. And this is Leo IX, the first re reforming pope. Here are some monks that we can see who uh, may or may not be Cluniacs, but they are certainly pious monks saying the liturgy. And here is a monastery. This is a plan of a monastery, St. Gall, a huge monastery, as you can see from this floor plan. Cluny was equally huge, huge and elaborate. Pope Leo IX was the first of what we call the modern reform popes. And Pope Leo IX ruled from 1049 to 1054. And as we said, he was a Cluniac monk, and he brought Cluniac ideas of reforming uh, not only the monasteries, but the secular clergy as well. The regular clergy are monks who live according to a rule, or canons who live according to a rule. The secular clergy are the clergy who deal with the care of lay people, the care of souls of lay people, and this would include priests, but also bishops and archbishops and the pope. The pope is, is secular clergy. Uh, Leo IX passed the decrees of the Council of Rance. And, and let me, let's follow these rules along that would reform the papacy. First, that no one should be advanced to the rule of a church without election by clergy and people. 
Second, that no one should buy or sell sacred orders or ecclesiastical offices or churches. Third, that no layman should hold an ecclesiastical office or a church, and that no bishop should consent to this. Fourth, that no one except the bishop or his representative should presume to exact dues at the entrances of churches. Fifth, that no one should demand anything as a burial fee or for administering baptism or the Eucharist or for visiting the sick. In other words, the, the priest cannot demand payment for the sacraments. Uh, sixth, that no cleric should bear arms or follow worldly occupations. Okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? They have to put down their swords. Uh, seven, that no cleric or layman should be a usurer. Eight, that no monk or cleric should apostatize from his order, that is, renounce his order. Ninth, that no person should dare to assault any person in holy orders while they are traveling. Tenth, that no one should injure poor men by thefts or frauds. Uh, Eleventh, that no one should participate in an incestuous union. And twelfth, that no one should desert his wife and marry another. So these are the reforms that the moderate reformers tried to impose on the church. There were about five moderate reform popes. I'm going to skip some of them, but the next important one is Pope Nicholas II. Uh, while the, the popes were trying to strengthen their position, the Norman power in Italy and Sicily was growing. And the Normans led in, in, in Italy, led by Robert Guiscard, had slowly built their power until Robert Guiscard ruled almost all of the south of Italy. But he was a bandit. He was a marauder. He literally stole Italy from the Lombard and Italian kingdoms that were there. Pope Nicholas II went to war with the Normans, and the Normans beat him. <laughs> And they took, they took the Pope captive, and to, to be free, Pope Nicholas had to make a treaty with the Normans. This is the Treaty of Melfi in 1059. And in this treaty, Robert Guiscard is recognized as the Duke of Apulia. In other words, his conquests are legitimized, and Robert Guiscard becomes a papal vassal. And so now... Uh, also, his nephew, Roger, was recognized as Count of Sicily at a time when Sicily was still Muslim. So what was this? This was a mandate for Roger to conquer Sicily. He was naming him Count of Sicily before he even conquered it. Roger also became a papal vassal. And the upshot is the popes now have an army. And let me read to you the oath of Robert Giscard. It's, it's, uh, I'll just read part of it to you, but it's really, it's really quite interesting. I, Robert, by the grace of God and St. Peter, Duke of Apulia and Calabria, and with the help of both future Duke of Sicily, will from this hour forward be faithful to the Holy Roman Church and the Apostolic See, and to you, my Lord Pope Nicholas, I will not give any counsel or commit any act whereby you would lose life or limb or fall into vile captivity. I will not knowingly disclose so as to injure you any information that you impart to me and forbid me to disclose. So far as lies within my power, I will support the Holy Roman Church in holding and acquiring the temporalities and possessions of St. Peter everywhere and against all men, and I will help you hold the Roman papacy securely and honorably. And he goes on, but it's a feudal oath of homage and fealty to the Pope. The Pope now, the Popes now have an army. They are feudal lords over the Normans in Italy, in Italy and eventually in Sicily. And they have vassals who will serve in their army. And here we see the map of Italy and Sicily, where you can see Apulia and Calabria, which is what Robert Giscard ruled over. Eventually he gets Benevento too. And here is Sicily, which uh, Roger the Great Count conquers with the help of his uncle Robert Giscard. Pope Alexander II succeeds Nicholas II. Uh, 
uh, Pope Alexander II ruled from 1061 to 1053. And he followed the same uh, pattern as uh, Pope Nicholas II. He gave William the Conqueror the papal banner to conquer England in 1066. Of course, William was still William the Bastard at that point. When he got the papal banner, when he conquered England in 1066, he became William the Conqueror. It was Pope Alexander II who appointed Lanfranc as Archbishop of Canterbury in 1070. And if you recall from my lecture about the, the, university, the schools and universities, Lanfranc was the teacher of Pope Alexander II. Lanfranc goes in and reforms the English church. One of the things he does is require all bishops to swear an oath of obedience to him. And in the Chronicles, there are statements that Lanfranc and later his uh, successor Anselm are considered Pope of another world, as if England, Britain, is another world uh, parallel to the continent and that the Archbishop of Canterbury is somehow equal to the Pope. At least the Archbishops of Canterbury claim that. The Archbishops of Canterbury quarrel with the Archbishops of York over obedience because the Archbishop of Canterbury requires all bishops in England to swear obedience and the Archbishop of York declares that he is equal to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Lanfranc forced the Archbishop of York to, to do a written oath of obedience to him. Lanfranc also appointed Norman abbots from his home abbey of Beck over uh, bi both bishoprics and abbeys in England, and monk bishops are introduced as the typical bishop in England from Beck. And here is Duke William, as we recall. Here is William, Duke of Normandy, raising up his helmet to identify himself during the Battle of Hastings. Alexander II was succeeded by Gregory VII. And uh, in the meantime, the Emperor Henry III, 1039 to 1056, had died, leaving a minor son, Henry IV, who ruled from 1056 to 1106. Now, we've already seen the papal election decree of 1059. What was the first decree of the Council of Rennes in 1059? It was that all elections should be carried out, that all um, uh, bishops and, and uh, archbishops and, and even popes, clerical elections should be carried out by election, not appointed. The popes are to be elected by cardinal bishops in the future. And the emperor, of course, would object to this, but we have a child on the throne. So the cardinals just charge ahead and they elect Hildebrand in 1073, and Hildebrand changes his name to Pope Gregory VII, a fiery reformer. Uh, the other great theoreticians at the papal court are Peter Damien and Humbert, and they are, they are much more, especially Peter Damien is much more conservative. Gregory VII issues what is called the Dictatus Papi, the sayings of the Pope. And let's turn to that for a moment. It's in your readings book on page 83. And I won't read through the entire program. It says the struggle between church and state, the program of Pope Gregory VII, 1073 to 1085. That the Roman church was founded by God alone that the Roman Pope alone is rightly called universal, that he alone can depose and reinstate bishops, uh, that his legate, even of lower rank, presides over all bishops in council and is able to declare sentence of deposition against them. And most importantly, that he, that the Pope can depose emperors, but the emperors cannot depose popes. That emperors are supposed to kiss the foot of the pope and the pope is not supposed to kiss the foot of the emperor and he goes on and on in that vein in a very radical way what, what do you think the emperors would think and the kings would think of this terrible this is not something the emperors and kings are going to like that gregory proclaiming himself the ruler of all well, he, Gregory did some other things as well, as if we could look at our slate again. 
In addition to issuing the Dictatus Papi, he sought the homage as feudal lord of all the kings of Europe. In other words, he wrote to all the kings of Europe, and these letters still exist, demanding that they recognize him as, his, as their feudal lord, that they swear hom homage and fealty to him. Uh, the kings of Denmark, Hungary, and Aragon all did so. They did swear homage and become the man of the pope as their feudal lord. And one reason these particular kings of Denmark, Hungary, and Aragon did that is because they're all relatively new converts and new kingdoms. So they're, they're sort of shaky and unstable, and the pope gives them legitimacy. William the Conqueror, however, refused, and he answered the pope saying, I do not see where my predecessor ever did this to your predecessor, and so therefore I will not do it. So William the Conqueror would recognize no one as his overlord. Um, and here we have the bronze statue of St. Peter in the very uh, uh, regal and monarchistic pose that Gregory VII has in mind for the popes, uh, St. Peter as the ruler of the world. Okay, and here is the vocation of St. Peter, the calling of St. Peter that we see uh, commemorated in this papal propaganda. And here is an imaginary election of St. Peter as Pope, uh, so that they're, they're reading back into the past the things that they want to promote in their present. They're, they're reconstructing a history for themselves that legitimates the claims. Uh, that the popes are making. And here is, uh, here is a later pope crowning an emperor. And look at that emperor. He's crawling on his hands and knees to kiss the ring of the pope. This is the ideal that the popes wanted. They wanted the emperors on their knees at their feet. This is what Gregory had in mind. And later, the, this pope um, uh, actually gets this in 1453. Henry, uh, when he grows up, uh, challenges this. He writes a letter to um, uh, Pope Gregory addressing him himself, announcing himself as Henry, king by the pious ordin ordination of God to Hildebrand, not, now not pope, but false monk. And so both of them are trying to depose each other. The bishop supported Henry and the noble supported Gregory. But Gregory so denounced Henry that now the bishops deserted Henry and he was, in, he was really in a dangerous position. So Henry had to seek forgiveness. He had to go figuratively on his hands and knees to the pope at the castle of Canossa in January in 1076. 1077, barefoot and in sackcloth and ashes. The castle of Canosa is right at the foot of the Alps. It's on a very tall foothill. And in January, it is knee deep in snow. I've been there in January. And you have to go walk up this very steep road going around and around the little hillock until you circle up to the top and um, in the snow. And it's cold. The castle of Canossa was owned by Matilda of Tuscany, who was the pope's greatest supporter. The pope's two supporters were the Norman army in southern Italy and Matilda of Tuscany's army in, in the area of Tuscany, just north of the Papal States. And Matilda of Tuscany was a very heroic woman who fought as a duke in her own right. She advised Gregory to forgive Henry as a penitent sinner. She said, you must forgive him as pope. It is your duty to forgive penitent sinner, sinners. Politically, it was a really bad move, but Gregory knew he had to forgive Henry. However, he made Henry, uh, Henry wait three days in the snow before he actually forgave him. As soon as he was forgiven, Gregory went right back home and organized his forces and challenged the pope again and declared him deposed. Uh, this is some alpine scenery at the foot of the Alps where you can see how freezing cold it is with the glaciers in the background. And here is Matilda of Tuscany. 
she is right up here, Matilda, and uh, this is um, Theobald, who is her uncle and uh, bishops uh, uh, around here. She, she had an uncle who was pope, and her whole family was very supportive of Gregory, but Matilda is the key person here. Okay, here is the hierarchy of the church from a later time with the pope in the center. You can see the two swords. Here is the pope with his pastoral staff, the shepherd's crook, and here is the emperor with his sword, the two swords, but the pope is above him. Um, you can see that he's taller than the emperor, and here are the vassals of the emperor and the monks and bishops and here's a cardinal bishops and, and everyone who is under the pope so this is the kind of hierarchy that gregory the seventh envisioned uh henry marched on rome and uh and actually um uh assaulted the city and and uh besieged it for four years from 1081 to 1084 and Gregory sent uh, sent word to the Normans to come and rescue him they had to come a long way because Robert Guiscard was in the process now of trying to conquer the Byzantine Empire and he was very successful at it he was in Greece he had to go home at the age of 70 he left the siege of the Byzantine Empire to march on Rome and the Normans uh, uh, took over Rome and sacked the city and uh, created more damage than any other invader, even the barbarians had uh, uh, put on Rome. Then the Normans withdrew, taking Gregory south with them. And Gregory died at Salerno saying, I have loved justice and hated iniquity, and so I die in exile. Well, Gregory VII has had lots of epitaphs uh, attached to him. The big question is, was Gregory a conservative or a revolutionary? Was he trying to return to the status of the papacy as it had been in the past, or was he um, proposing a whole new revolutionary turn to uh, the power of the papacy? What do you all think? Who would vote for him as a conservative? You, then you all think he's a revolutionary? I kind of do too. <laughs> I think he's pretty revolutionary. Some of, I mean, but if you think about some of the power that Gregory the Great, Gregory the Great had, for example, uh, he had some of those powers. So you can think of of uh, Gregory the Seventh as trying to return to some of those powers. Well, the conflict between church and state provoked an unprecedented outpouring of propaganda. The Norman Anonymous wrote that the Pope was subordinate to kings and he supported a theory of sacral kingship. On the other side, Manigold of Lautenberg wrote Pope, uh, a pro-papal tract, the Liber de Unitate Ecclesia Conservanda, uh, the book of conserving the unity of the church. The argument comes to center around investitures, and this is called the investiture contest or the investiture controversy. Do you all know what investitures are? Investiture is when a person is handed the symbols of his office or his land or his position so that a feudal lord when he grants a, a manor house or a, or a piece of property to his vassal, will give him like a lump of dirt. And that's investing him with that property or that land. In the case of a bishop, the king or the lord will hand the bishop his pastoral staff and ring. And this hands him his office and along with the lands that the king might give to the bishop. The church, of course, objects because this means the king is choosing that bishop and actually investing him with his office. So this is what the church uh, objects to, the, the lay investiture of churchmen. And what the church says no is no layman should invest churchmen. At the same time, the church says no churchman should do homage to a layman. 
And now what effect is this going to have on the feudal system? What's going to happen to the feudal system if homage and investiture is outlawed, are outlawed? It's going to break down the entire structure because when the, the Lord gives lands to his vassals, he gets in return an oath of homage and fealty. And this breaks down the entire system if the bishop can no longer do homage and fealty to the king or his lord for the lands that he owns, for the temporalities. Because the bishop is a vassal like everybody else and, and he owes homage and fealty to his lord. So this would destroy the whole feudal system unless you listen to Gregory VII who wants everybody to do homage to him and <laughs> he wants to alter the feudal system. Okay, and, and so this is the, the, the answer of the kings. They return to the image of Constantine and they say, we are crowned by God, the sacral kingship, and only God can take it away from us, not the Pope. Okay, so two competing theory. Here is a bishop ordaining a priest and uh, this is an investiture of a priest by a churchman. So you can see uh, this kind of investiture here. Well, the church-state conflict in England preceded the church-state conflict in Germany, uh, the investiture controversy. It started under William Rufus, who, who was the son of William the Conqueror. King William II Rufus ruled from 1089 to 1100. And the quarrels between church and state took place between him and Archbishop Anselm, who was the student and successor of Lanfranc. And Anselm was Archbishop, 1093 to 1109. Anselm immediately voiced his theory of kingship. And this is his theory. It's called the two oxen theory. You must think of the church as a plow. This plow in England is drawn by two oxen outstanding above the rest, and these two, by drawing the plow, rule the land, the king and the archbishop of Canterbury. The former rules by secular justice and sovereignty, imperio, the latter by divine doctrine and teaching, magisterio. Okay, do you think the king's going to like this theory? Why not? What's wrong with this theory in the king's eye? Yeah. He doesn't have all the power. The king doesn't have the power. What the archbishop is saying is the archbishop and king are equal. They're two oxen drawing the plow as equals. And so this, of course, is very objectionable to the kings, especially William Rufus, who, who really went ballistic over the whole thing. Uh, and in fact, William Rufus ended by sending Anselm into exile by 1097. They fought and quarreled and, and, and struggled for uh, four years. And then William Rufus just threw Anselm out of the kingdom and wouldn't let him take any baggage or money or anything with him. He, Anselm went in exile and completely impoverished. Meanwhile, Urban II had succeeded Gregory VII as Pope, and Urban ruled from 1088 to 1099. The really brilliant stroke of genius that Urban uh, did, carried out, was to call the First Crusade in 1095, and it was a tremendous gamble. I mean, it inspired all of Europe. It galvanized Europe, and, and, and the, the knights yelled, God wills it, God wills it, and they all joined together and, of course, went on crusade. Interestingly, when you analyze actually who went on crusade, it's interesting that not many Germans or, uh, from Germany or Anglo-Normans from England went. Uh, they were happy to stay home, and they are not papal supporters. The French and Italian Normans went on crusade to win glory for themselves and to serve the pope. And here is the Eastern Mediterranean during the crusades. Of course, they had a long way to go, and uh, they eventually founded the crusader states. And here is the combat between the crusaders and the Muslims as they're fighting on crusade. The crusade lasted from 1096 to 1099, and it was not clear that the Christians were going to win. They suffered terrible losses at the hands of the Muslims. They were really slaughtered. 
because they weren't used to that kind of fighting in Europe. In Europe, they did little hit-and-run battles. Uh, it, this was out-and-out -out vicious warfare in the Crusades, and it wasn't clear who was going to win. And while the outcome was unsure and the pap Pope was in a very precarious position, Roger the Great Count, who by now had conquered Sicily, wrung concessions from Urban in return for supporting the Pope and not allying with William Rufus and the Emperor surrounding Rome and also not recognizing the anti-Pope. And the concessions that uh, Roger the Great won was that he was to be head of the Italian Church and the Sicilian Church and he had the right to appoint all the bishops. And he's the only ruler in Germany who won that right from, uh, or the only ruler in Europe who won that right from the Pope. And he did it by, you know, uh, kicking the Pope when he was down before the, the crusade had been successful. The threat was, if you don't give me power over my own church, I'm going to form an alliance with William Rufus in England and the emperor in Germany. And where would that leave the Pope? completely surrounded by his enemies. This would be a disaster. Well, the disaster um, sort of disappeared when William Rufus died in August 1100. He had threatened to recognize the anti-pope. Anti he didn't do it. Urban had died in July 1099, and Jerusalem fell right after that at the end of 1099. So Urban really never did see the success of the crusade, but it guaranteed, it put the seal of success on the reform papacy, and it meant that after that, the popes would succeed. But one of Urban's greatest achievements was legal reform, and, and Rome became the court of appeal for all the courts of Europe. Any churchman who was unhappy with the king's judgment could appeal to the pope and have it reversed. And here we can see this map. Um, the papal lands are right, right here, and with the Normans uh, right here, with the Normans in Italy and Sicily here, and the Germans and the English, um, if, if they were to form an alliance, the Pope would be surrounded and in great trouble. And here are the courts of the Pope. Here is the court, the plenary court of Dame Justice. Uh, this is at a time when the power of the courts is rising not only in the papal courts, but also in, the, in England and France and Germany, that, that the courts of justice are becoming more powerful as a tool for the kings to unify their kingdom and increase their own power. So the papacy is developing its administrative and legal institutions side by side with those being developed by the kings of Europe. Paschal II was the new pope in Rome, and Henry I was the new king in England. Henry called Anselm back to England from exile, and the king and pope ruled together like two oxen for at least four years. But Anselm was against investitures, having heard the practice outlawed in Rome with his own ears, and so he told Henry, I cannot allow you to invest bishops. Henry, however, said, you know, look, can't you go to the Pope and tell him that I can never give up homage? And so Anselm did. He went to Paschal on behalf of Henry, but Paschal refused to yield and allow England to have its hereditary practices. So Henry sent Anselm into exile again. <laughs> right, and meanwhile, Henry tried to conquer Normandy. He was dead set on conquering Normandy from his brother, Robert Curthos, who was Duke of Normandy, and have all the lands his father had had. But Anselm stopped him, not with an army, but by launching a propaganda campaign, by writing letters back and forth and writing to people and getting them to abandon Henry, and they did. There's evidence that Henry's allies abandoned him just as he was on the verge of conquering Normandy. So Henry had to give in and make peace with Anselm. They came to a compromise at the Concordat of Beck 
in 1106, just on the eve of the Battle of Tanchebray. And they came to a compromise whereby the king gave up investitures of churchmen in return for being allowed to receive the homage of churchmen. So the king kept homage but gave up investitures. In 1107 at the Council of London, Archbishop Anselm and King Henry appointed bishops together. So the king retained his right to appoint the bishops. The Concordat of Bec in 1106 predated and prefigured the Concordat of Worms in 1122. The king gave up investitures of bishop with ring and staff and retained the right to receive homage for feudal lands of bishops. At issue was the appointment of bishops. The settlement was a compromise. One of the most important results was to encourage the growth of doctrines justifying resistance by subjects to unjust rulers. So theories of tyranny and good kingship now begin to circulate in Europe. Here is the Council of London <clears throat> where we can see uh, the king and the, and the archbishop ruling together and appointing the bishops uh, to their, their post, to the vacant bishoprics. This is a copy of the Concordat of Worms. This is the actual Concordat, the written agreement uh, signed by both the king and the pope. And, um, and the handwriting is very papal and very different from some of the handwriting I've shown you before. And here is the pope serving as a peacemaker with the king. And so, uh, excuse me, an archbishop serving as a peacemaker with the king. And that's how Anselm saw his role. The fate of Jerusalem, remember that they did conquer Jerusalem. The fate of Jerusalem was that the papal legate who was in charge and was supposed to take charge of the kingdom of Jerusalem soon lost power. Godfrey of Bouillon was one of the crusaders who was actually uh, chosen as the leader and ruler of the kingdom of Jerusalem. At first, he refused to take the title of king. Instead, no, I am just going to be the advocatus, the spokesman for uh, Jerusalem. It is God who is king. But he died within the first year of his rule in uh, 1099, and his brother Baldwin of Flanders became king. And Baldwin did not hesitate to become king, and he took on the theory of government of sacral kingship that he ruled with the right of God. God had chosen him king. The fate of imperial Germany was that the popes fomented continual wars, continual rivalries among the different uh, uh, tribal duchies of Germany. Uh, one group would elect one king and one group, group would elect someone else king and the pope would throw his weight to, to the weakest side so that he was actually fomenting civil war, and Germany was racked with civil war. Germany never unified until the 18th century. By the time of the Reformation, it was divided up into 300 separate provinces. And so the popes destroyed Germany and its hope of ever being a unified state. The fate of England was that the Canterbury-York controversies uh, eroded the power of the Archbishop of Canterbury. No one ever had the power of Anselm again to rule side by side with the king. Both Canterbury and York sought papal support to be in their quarrels, and the popes usually sided with York because they viewed Canterbury as too powerful in England. The Archbishop of Canterbury to claim the same power of the king? No, the popes did not like that. They wanted control over the Archbishop of Canterbury. So therefore, the pope supported the rival archbishops of York against the archbishops of Canterbury, playing one side against the other. The kings, too, sided with York because they didn't want the Archbishop of Canterbury to be their equal either, so they sided with York, and that eroded the power of the Archbishop of Canterbury. 
And this is what is behind the whole Beckett story that we heard last week. In fact, Beckett was fighting for that supremacy, that criminous clerks could not be tried in the king's court. He wanted to have the right to try them in the archbishop's court. And, and King Henry got so annoyed with Beckett, he said, won't anyone rid me of this troublesome priest? And of course, four knights heard him and they went out and did it. And so Beckett became England's own martyr. And uh, this temporarily strengthened the hand of the archbishop, but ultimately the king eroded his power by appointing weak men or by appointing men who would not challenge him. So England too, um, England remained strong politically, but the church-state uh, controversy sort of faded out after a while. They really ended, of course, when Henry VIII broke with the papacy and declared himself the head of the English church. Okay, so here are the kingdoms of Jerusalem that we might see for a minute. Here's the kingdom of Jerusalem and the uh, other crusader states, as we recall. And here are the kingdoms of Germany, France, and England, uh, which we've just reviewed. And, and here you can see the Papal States are right here. You can actually see them on this map. And this is the Kingdom of Italy and Sicily down here. Okay, you can see the Papal States. The, now began the age of lawyers, which began with Pope Urban. In 1100, Irenarius of Bologna lectured on Roman law, and the institutes of Justinian were recovered. Gratian's Decretum was compiled, and it was a huge collection, a massive compilation of texts of ecclesiastical law and canon law. He codifies the ecclesiastical law. All the popes were now lawyers, and at this time the papal court mirrored the king's court. The court of the pope in Rome was now the court of appeal to all churchmen in Europe. Uh, the king's counselors, who were the barons, were mirrored by the papal counselors, who were the cardinals. The popes required obedience from all churchmen. The kings required homage from all their vassals. And so we're having parallel administrative and bureaucratic growth in all the kingdoms of Europe and in the papal court. It's all parallel. Frederick Barbarossa built a strong government temporarily in Germany. He resisted the popes, but in the end, uh, the popes prevailed, and they, as we have seen, they destroyed Germany. Here is the kind of court that both kings and popes were forming. Here is the king's court, and here are the bishops and the barons and uh, the monks and the clerks who are at his court. Here are the criminals being tried in the court, and the papal court, likewise, was done this. Innocent III represented the height of papal monarchy. Innocent III demanded and got homage from King John for England, and of course the barons went nuts. They were very upset at King John. King John lost Normandy, and he also did homage to the pope for England, saying that the pope owned England and, and the pope was his feudal lord. Innocent III also called the Albigensian Crusade. It was a crusade inside of Europe, not outside. It was against southern France, where all the heretics were. And what it ended up doing was to help build the French monarchy, which kept the best relationships with the papacy of any of the kingdoms. Innocent III also began the Inquisition in France, the trying of heretics at his court, which included uh, various forms of torture. The Dominican order arose at that time to preach uh, in the heretical countries. Uh, he also, Innocent also called a crusade in southern Italy against his political rivals, and he called crusades in northern Europe, uh, sending crusaders to Prussia, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, where conversion was carried out. One of the best things Innocent did was to recognize St. Francis of Assisi, who had a tremendous popular following, and, and Innocent would have been crazy not to recognize his order. But in fact, other heretics 
had the same program as Francis, he was lucky he was not declared a heretic because what he was preaching was the same as people like the Waldensians. But Innocent recognized the friars minor, the little brothers. And here is a portrait of Pope Honorius to, to give you an idea of what popes in the time of Innocent looked like. He, he followed Innocent as pope. And here is a bird's eye view of the Lateran Basilica palace and annex as the headquarters of this imperial papacy in Rome. Here is St. Francis's marriage with poverty, which was uh, one of his, uh, of course, he took off all his clothes and gave them to the poor. And so this, he, he took a vow of poverty like Christ and corporate poverty as well. Of course, his friars did not hold any property like the rich monasteries did. So this is complete poverty. And here are two renderings of St. Francis preaching to the birds. I mean, it was an, an enormously popular and widespread order in Europe. Meanwhile, the monarchies were growing stronger. England developed centralized administrative government. Henry I and Henry II together developed common law, the beginnings of the exchequer or the treasury. Magna Carta was signed. A bureaucracy was built to uh, govern the country, a centralized administration. France, on the other hand, developed a different form of kingship, a saintly kingship, where the king was the symbol and center of government. And so St. Louis was actually the, the most saintly of these kings. The saintliness of the king was recognized. The French kings also associated this, the king's son as heirs with the king during their own lifetime so that there would never be a war of succession in France and there never was. They also had good luck. They only had one son and they didn't have the sons fighting for kingship. So the French kings had good luck. They built strong, centralized, powerful government. And the final quarrel was between Pope Boniface VIII and, Pope Philip, uh, and King Philip the Fair of France. It was over the right of the kings to tax the clergy, and Philip was strong enough to tax the clergy. Boniface objected by publishing his decree, Clericis Laicos, which excommunicated virtually everyone in France. And at that, uh, Philip the Fair captured Boniface, took him captive, and took the whole papacy to Avignon in the middle of France. And here is St. Louis as the epitome of French kingship. And here is St. Louis um, showing his, getting his authority directly from God. And this is the form of government that prevailed. The popes never reached this kind of power again. The, the state had won out in the quarrel between church and state. Okay, we'll see you next week. And I've forgotten what we're going to do next week. But <laughs> I think we're doing philosophy. <laughs>